Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm back here from uh, resuming from yesterday. Yesterday, we had already talked about uh, how to formalize cryptographic primitives. We had talked about um, way, um, a, a syntax uh, that makes us uh, able to reason about cryptographic algorithms, about their security in particular. And then we had formalized primitives, um, including symmetric key primitives. And this was uh, pseudorandom generators and uh, pseudorandom functions. These are at the core of um, uh, the cryptographic um, arsenal, if you want to say. The, um, towards the end, we formalized also. We also talked about the one-time path. This is the most basic uh, crypto system that one has to understand and one-time secure secret key encryption. And towards the end yesterday, we formalized also public key crypto systems that allow you to encrypt with a different key uh, than decrypting. Yeah? So in a public key crypto system, one has uh, two different uh, keys. Now today we're going to implement this uh, with uh, tools from uh, the so-called uh, well, world of discrete logarithms, <laughs> where this is a number theoretic primitive that allows you to implement uh, a lot of cryptographic schemes. And then we're going to extend this also to the setting uh, that is distributed, okay? So yesterday already we mentioned, and that's what I wrote here on the, uh, on the handout uh, that you were gonna get. And I hope the quality is gonna be a bit better than yesterday because I'm using a different app. Um, so that I wrote already here, that uh, public key crypto systems must use randomness. And the reason is that um, anyone can try to encrypt the message. And the security that we have in public key cryptography requires that um, you are uh, getting an encryption of one of two different messages. And you don't know which message is actually encrypted. And the, it's a third entity or it's a, this kind of setup that gives you this, that picks one or the other. And you are going, if you try to break the crypto system, going to guess which one was encrypted, yeah. And if the encryption was deterministic, of course, uh, you could just try to re-encrypt the same message again and figure out whether this is the thing that comes out. So uh, there must be randomness in the encryption process, otherwise it uh, will not work. So that's the thing I wanted to uh, resume and take up again uh, from, from yesterday. Okay, um, for the number theoretic primitives, let me now uh, start to talk about discrete logs or discrete logarithms and about the corresponding mathematics only a little bit because um, there can be much more said about this. Um, a logarithm is, as you probably know, or you should all know, is the inverse operation of exponentiation. And we are doing this in discrete uh, mathematical structures, so-called um, cyclic groups and um, where we believe that taking computing these discrete logarithms is hard yeah because there are no most most representations of such groups there are no efficient algorithms known for uh, computing discrete logs yeah so we are uh, given here um, a cyclic group I'm going to just uh, say what this is, G, that we're going to write like this, yeah? And this means it's a set of elements such that you can compute each uh, element uh, in, uh, let me just take a different notation, each, for each element in G, you can, you can find some I, such that this other element g to the power of i is equal to um, this uh, this y. That means uh, you can basically take g to the power 0, g to the power 1, g to the power 2, and so on, and you get uh, the whole set of elements. You get this whole group, yeah? If you want, then that's why there is a cycle, because at the end, you're going to have, again, uh, return to the same element. Um, the number of elements in this group uh, is necessarily, uh, for our security assumption at the moment, is, an, is, a, is prime. So that means that the cardinality of our set here is uh, another prime uh, 
that we call Q. Yeah. And in this setting here, uh, we believe, we don't have a proof, but we believe that computing discrete logarithms is hard. Yeah. So the problem of computing discrete logarithms uh, will be to, um, or if you want to say the discrete logarithm problem, it will be given a random element of the group, such as the y up here, compute the i such that g to the power i is this y, yeah? discrete logarithm problem that we also abbreviate as DLP. This will be um, when you're given a random element um, of G for which nobody necessarily knows um, this discrete logarithm. And remember this notation here that we are where we are writing this arrow. This means select with a uniform random probability from the this uh, from the set. Yeah. So given this compute, and I'm going to change notation, the x such that g to the power x equals y. Yeah. And this computation is in this group yeah um, that means uh, if you can break this with non-negligible probability then you can compute discrete logarithms and this would not be secure our assumption that we are going to use for public key cryptography is that uh, this problem is hard that you cannot compute such a one, uh, x except with negligible uh, probability yeah. uh, in the interest of time i'm not going to formalize this now in the style of libraries, but we could do that uh, here equally likely, okay? And in practice, we are going to need some actual representations, some examples of groups G where this uh, DLP is hard. And there we are often using a subgroup of uh, ZP, where ZP is the integers modulo P, another prime, where P is prime. And so this is going to be a prime order subgroup of, of the integers. And if you are into algebra, then you will know that P must be M times Q plus one, such that uh, this actually works. Yeah? And other groups where this is going to be used um, are uh, so-called elliptic curves, which are um, solution sets to algebraic equations, also again uh, represented uh, modulo primes. Um, and this gives rise to the whole uh, set of crypto systems that are elliptic curve, blah, blah, like elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, and so on. Yeah? So the groups defined over elliptic curves um, again uh, represented uh, modulo uh, prime p the primes in the prime order subgroup present representation here have to be of size several thousand bits today so that means the parameters here for the first kind are actually larger than those for the second kind, where we can have parameters that are sized only like uh, two, 256 bits, uh, for example. Yeah. So here, here should uh, should I note that p is maybe 2,000 bits today. Secure the length of p, uh, and and here, um, uh, let me just write the group size here. That's enough if this group is about 2 to the 256. That means you can represent uh, the Q, the exponents, with 256 bits alone. That's why this is more efficient and keys are actually a lot uh, smaller. Okay? Good. So now we have the discrete log problem. Um, there, is a, there are several variations of this or strengthenings. Um, second is the... Uh, Diffie-Hellman problem, the so-called Diffie-Hellman problem, uh, and that refers to the uh, Diffie-Hellman key agreement protocol, 
And a third will be the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem. Let me just jump to the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem and explain what is going on there because it will connect us better to the distinguish indistinguishability-based formalization when we look at the actual public key uh, crypto system. Yeah? So um, the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem, so we had here the computational Diffie-Hellman, uh, the discrete logarithm problem in the so-called um, decisional Diffie-Hellman problem, we are going to give you a triple of values and you have to decide whether or not um, they have a certain structure. Yeah? So let me just uh, define it like this uh, here, the decisional uh, Diffie-Hellman, and this goes back to the uh, discovery of public key uh, crypto by Diffie and Hellman. The decisional Diffie-Hellman problem is um, given by uh, three random, uh, or, well, let's just see, yeah. <laughs> um, we are computing first a, uh, we're computing three random values, namely from our uh, exponent set A, B and C, there are three random values here, yeah? Uh, we're not given those, okay, we're not given those. Yeah. So let me just wipe this out here. We're not giving those, yeah. Find for these values, okay? Um, and, um, I wanna say, okay. From these values, we're gonna compute A as g to the power little a, capital B as g to the power little b and capital C as g to the power uh, little c, yeah? Um, this is something that's computed in the back, yeah? And now um, we're either in the sense of libraries, if you want to say, um, we are given either a triple capital A, capital B, and G to the power A times B, yeah? Or we are given um, the triple A, B, and C, where there is no such relation on the third element, right? And um, so the, the, the assumption is that these, um, the um, decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption is that triples of uh, this first sort are going to be indistinguishable from triples of the second sort, yeah? Um, that you cannot tell whether you are receiving a triple that is constructed like this on the left, like a red triple, or a blue triple here that's purely random, right? So, um, if you can distinguish these kind of triples, uh, if your adversary is linked to a library that outputs these to you and can tell this, then it would be uh, breaking the decisional or solving the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem and uh, breaking the so-called assumption. Now, um, we want to build a encryption system using this method, yeah? And uh, I invite you to read up on the uh, Diffie-Hellman protocol, a Diffie-Hellman key agreement protocol, um, where you're going to see how A, B, and uh, the red triple here on the left uh, comes out of this, yeah? So yesterday we had already mentioned what a public key uh, crypto system uh, contains. And if you're using this mechanism here now for encryption, you're going to get the al Gamal uh, public key uh, crypto system. The Algamal public key crypto system needs first a key generator, as we said also yesterday. The key generator is doing what happens here um, on the left, yeah? or part of it actually. Yeah? It picks a x value, a scalar from zq, and then it computes in our group uh, g to the power of x 
And this is going to be our public key. Let me write the public key here with a capital Y. And it's going to return a public key Y and the secret key, the private key X in the second position. Okay, with this, now we have the uh, encryption algorithm uh, as the next thing we have to specify. For encryption now, we are picking a second random element. And if you remember how we encrypt, we give the public key first for the encryption, and then there has to be some message. And here we are assuming that the message itself is also an element of our group. Yeah, This is not necessarily the case uh, always, and we can discuss later how we are going to make this happen in uh, practice. So in order to uh, actually encrypt, we compute the second half of this uh, with respect to the A and B and C above, we are picking a random exponent R from ZQ again. We are going to um, compute capital R that is going to be G to the power of little r. And then we are computing this um, ciphertext, which is now also a deterministic comp computation, where we are simply multiplying our message that we want to uh, encrypt or hide with um, the public key y raised to the power of our exponent r. And this is uh, part of the ciphertext that we are returning. Yeah? So we need to return the tuple of r and c, which is going to be our uh, ciphertext itself. Okay? So this is how we encrypt, yeah? And for decryption, we are given the secret key. The secret key was the x. And we are also um, taking the uh, giving some, uh, we are given something to decrypt, namely a tuple RC. And so to decrypt this is uh, relatively easy because we can compute some m hat, which is supposedly the value that we are going to uh, decrypt again. We have the little, uh, we have the secret exponent x. And we are taking a C and divide it by R raised to the power of X. And we are returning this M hat. Okay. So that is a public key encryption system that is secure in the sense of indistinguishable encryptions or secure against chosen plain text attacks under that decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption I mentioned before. Okay. But let's first see of uh, the other property why it actually works, yeah? Completeness. Completeness means that um, for each key, for each key pair, a, the decryption of an encryption, uh, the decryption of an encryption of a particular message is going to be the message itself, okay? So what we are going to do here is uh, just uh, compute what happens, right? RC supposedly is now an encryption of our message under the public key YM. And um, we're going to decrypt this, yeah? We're getting M hat according to the formula on the right, which is going to be C. Um, well, wait, let me write it out first, okay? Decryption on the X of or C, and now we want to show that M hat is equal to M. Uh, if we expand what happens here, then we realize that M is equal to C divided by R to the power of X, but R was computed during the encryption here as um, G to the power R, and C was computed as M to the uh, times y to the power r, and y was the public key that comes from the left here. So this is g to the x, and this raised to the power of r, and uh, divided the whole thing by r to the power of x, and r, as we said, is going to be uh, g to the power r, yeah, and this raised to the to x to the power of x, 
And now we are realizing here that um, this value and this value is the same, of course, because in exponentiation is commutative. So uh, yeah, that's it, because these, these two values divide out, okay? This is what we wanted to show, that you're getting out um, the value that you're encrypting. The second uh, thought we want to give here is for the security in the sense of having indistinguishable uh, encryptions under a chosen plain text attack. And for this, um, we are informally going to argue what the adversary sees here. Um, if I see a encryption of a message here, I basically see, um, I'm looking here at the encryption algorithm here. Uh, we are basically seeing a tuple that contains, uh, first of all, um, this R, which is g to the power something random, and C, which is, uh, contains this uh, public key and the M. And so an encryption on the Y of some message M left, yeah? This is going to be, I'm not going to write it uh, formally speaking, it's going to contain, actually also we are adding the public key to this because this is also there. And then there is the element R and the third element is going to be um, the C that was computed like this, which is basically um, M left times um, g to the power x times little r, where um, x and r are uh, computed as above. And if we encrypt another message here, then we are getting out almost the same, but with a different offset here. Of course, we know this ML and MR, so we can divide it out again. But this distribution of such a triple here is in both times uh, something that we can easily transform to a so-called Diffie-Hellman triple. Yeah? So this is a Diffie-Hellman triple, as we showed here above in this case here. So this is, oh, I should take the red. The red here is a DH uh, triple. The blue thing is a random triple. And so this here is a Diffie-Hellman triple in both cases, yeah. Now, in order to formally, formally show this, we need to also say that if we can distinguish an encryption, uh, uh, two, two encryptions, then we can also distinguish, uh, or being able to distinguish encryptions of two values is equivalent to being able to distinguish an encryption of not one known value from a random uh, ciphertext, yeah? And a random ciphertext, uh, if everything is just computed randomly, a random encryption uh, uh, triple, is simply going to be a triple where there is no such relation whatsoever between the three values. And here we're going to compute a, uh, let me write this Z, where Z is computed as g to the power Z uh, for a random Z again. So this is going to be a random triple if we can distinguish um, between the two above here, then you can also distinguish one of the two above from the random triple, and you could break this uh, crypto system because you could distinguish what's inside. So that's the Diffie-Hellman, uh, sorry, that's the El Gamal public key encryption system. That is um, now a single scheme with deterministic and probabilistic algorithms, usually run by um, one party. And we are going to be interested now in how to make this uh, distributed. If there are questions, better please interrupt me. Yeah?
not. Okay, so we're going to use distributed cryptography. That's actually the fourth part in our internal um, notation here. And in a distributed cryptography um, setting, we would like a group of nodes here, P1, P2, up to Pn, to operate the crypto system. Yeah? And for, this, for doing this, we are going to take the private key that exists here and to distribute this private key in the distributed system. Yeah? Here we have our processes. And so the operation that is security critical will have to be done in a fault tolerant way by the processes themselves. <clears throat> so, and we're going to have n processes here. And together they shall operate the public key crypto system, for example. Which one? Okay, let's see. Yeah. Let us first uh, look at the basic primitive behind here, which is um, secret sharing. Secret sharing, again, among a uh, group of N nodes. Question? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, uh, just for the future. If you ask a question or you wait for a question, maybe give a little bit of uh, lag because there's um, a considerable lag between uh, the translation and, uh, and you actually talking. So the students receive the picture and the, and the sound uh, like a few seconds later. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> I we didn't know this is it's translated. Yeah. No, no, it's not even translated. No, it's uh, uh, I mean projected to the students a few seconds later. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. It's, um, yeah, yeah. Not, not of course that there's no, there's no translation. Uh, okay. And uh, maybe, maybe before we go to the distributed crypto systems, um, you described the one crypto scheme, which is Elga Mouse. Uh, that was because it is the easiest to explain, or because it has the most, uh, like it, this is the most popular, most efficient. It's not um, okay. Uh, it's it's relatively easy to explain, but uh, com compared to RSA, it takes less complicated mathematics in a way. Uh, but much more importantly, it's uh, much easier to explain how to do this in a distributed setting that you are looking at here. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. So secret sharing is uh, the, a protocol, again, for n parties, where there is a secret initially. Let me call this um, secret um, S that is known initially to a dealer, like a third party that's not part of PN, yeah? uh, part of the, our group uh, here. So to some trusted uh, process that we sometimes call dealer also, yeah. And the secret sharing is a scheme that produces from the secret itself so-called shares, such that each process P1 up to PM can then store a share for itself. And uh, these shares have the uh, properties that whenever there are enough more than a certain number of um, processes coming together and pooling their shares, then they will be able to recover the secret S. If there are fewer than this number of processes that pool their shares, they will not be able to recover the secret. And it doesn't matter which ones of the processes can recover this uh, uh, secret again. Yeah. Um, so um, we are going to compute shares. Uh, let me denote these shares here by S1 up to Sn. There's no coincidence it's the same now because the shares of the secret S are going to be this S1 up to N such that um, Pi is going to hold or receive share Si. And we have the security property that um, any F or um, fewer uh, parties or processes, processes cannot get uh, information on S. I can 
on a different page, continue here. But any f plus one or more, of course, yeah, processes they can compute s again and thereby recover it. Such schemes here are also called threshold secret sharing schemes because there is a sharp threshold of f plus one, if you want to say here, or f uh, that denotes the number of uh, processes that are needed to recover that secret itself. Yeah. How to implement this? I trust that you all have uh, worked with polynomials in uh, math courses. And I'm showing here a, uh, a polynomial over the reals, but we are going to use a polynomial over a finite field. Yeah, The polynomial here is selected totally randomly, but it has a certain uh, structure. Yeah, So the polynomial itself here, we call it A. Yeah, So um, the polynomial here has degree exactly F. So that means there are points on this polynomial here. And you already know that we need f plus one points to uniquely characterize a polynomial of degree f. And so we're going to pick this polynomial randomly, but we're going to make sure that our secret here is at zero, the value of the polynomial. Okay, so um, such that our polynomial here, a x is random. Um, let me call this uh, over a finite field here with um, well, P, we had it already. Let's oh, let's still look, use, use Q then. Okay, uh, Q is better, right? Anyway, um, is purely random. That means all the coefficients um, except for the constant coefficient are chosen randomly. And the constant coefficient is picked such that exactly uh, the value of the polynomial as zero is s. Okay. Now um, you already probably see what happens. What's going to happen here if we take any? Ah, we have to say what happens. What what we do first? Okay. Let's just say then we compute uh, shares s i are computed as evaluating the polynomial for party i at the point i itself yeah so the share for pi is a point on this polynomial and now i can come back with my blue color here where this is a uh, party i that has share si okay um, that also means um, any group of or any set um, s of it's not a nice s any set S of F plus one processes, they know F plus one such points on the polynomial and therefore they can use Lagrange interpolation to recover A of zero. Mm -hmm. Can recover S using interpolation using uh, the formula of Lagrange. Let me just write this out, just because um, uh, we'll use this uh, structure later. Yeah, and this formula simply says that um, we can get to the polynomial at point zero by essentially computing a linear combination of these shares S i. Yeah, and this linear combination ranges over the elements in our participant set S that has enough processes, namely f plus one. And there are going to be Lagrange coefficients, which we are not concerned about now, how they are computed, but they depend on the set itself. They depend on the point to which we interpolate and on the party itself. But here it's basically a linear combination of these SIs from the participants that are here. So from this, they can recover that, yeah? This is the first property you want to achieve. The second property is the security. 
Um, and the second property, I'm only informally arguing here, uh, but any set um, of F processes to be maximal here, they have um, no information whatsoever on the secret itself. And if you're interested in the formal model of this, then that book of the joy of cryptography that we used before has a formal proof um, of this also in the language we used uh, before. It has no information on S and this is unconditional in the sense of the one-time path. So there's going to be an interchangeable libraries if we formalize this uh, properly. Okay, good. So what do we have now? We have a protocol or a scheme that requires our uh, trusted dealer here, our trusted process that takes this S initially, computes shares like this, and gives them to all the participants. And later then we can actually recover these shares and we can get these shares, uh, or from enough of those shares, we can uh, recover the secret itself again. Okay, uh, maybe I pause now for questions. Um, well, I, I don't see any questions for the moment. I think uh, good, <laughs> go. clear. Okay, so let us try to construct. Uh, wait, 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 wait a second. Yes. Just, just one second, because again, uh, because of the delay, so there is there is one question coming, possibly. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, uh, it's more like a, a comment. So we are not considering how the shares are distributed right now. Uh, we make an assumption. <laughs> that means we have to assume that somebody uh, has, pro has given these shares properly to all the participants. That's an assumption. That means uh, it's, it's more work that we can do later. Uh, there are sophisticated protocols that have uh, the goal of constructing such a sharing in a distributed system itself. In the handout on distributed cryptography, I gave you a couple of pointers to such protocols. They actually produce even more. For the moment, we are not assuming this. In a practical system, yes, you have to do it. Either somebody sets it all up in, uh, ahead of time, or then you're on a protocol that is more complicated than what I'm going to show. But such systems have been implemented already. Okay. Okay. Now um, we would like to uh, have return to the decryption operation or to the L gamma crypto system, and we'll have to say, let us now encrypt something for this group. Okay. So let us uh, use the key for the L gamma uh, crypto system, which was the X, if I recall right. Uh, which was the, the private key. And we had y equal g to the power x, the public key. Oh, this was a capital Y, sorry. Oh, where did we go? Here. Uh, so let us now take this private key and somebody ahead of time has distributed this distributed this X into secret shares X1 up to Xn um, such that all the participants here hold actually uh, a share of this private key. Oh, an important point I forgot to mention before is, and but you've, you've definitely seen this, that it doesn't matter here which set of S parties comes together because the interpolation gives the same result no matter which F plus one points on the polynomial we are starting from. So that makes the whole thing fault tolerant and robust because it doesn't matter if a party actually, a one of our N parties um, disappears or, or does not cooperate in the protocol. Now we've set up the system such that X1 up to Xn are um, distributed here and we are wondering how to do the decryption operation. And the trivial solution that is not threshold crypto, that is not useful, will be to run first the reconstruction operation here with the interpolation to the secret key 
and then we would get back the x again somewhere. Each participant would know this and then could do the decryption of a ciphertext that was encrypted using LGML. It's not going to be useful because we can decrypt only once with this scheme. So we must not assemble the key itself if we want to use this scheme multiple times. And that's what the following protocol is now going to do, namely um, to implement the decryption as a fault tolerant uh, computation. Yeah. So we have such a, uh, I wanted to just mention that you have this uh, sharing um, of X in a, let me call this F plus one out of N secret sharing scheme, yeah? That means we need F plus one to recover it, okay? But we are not gonna recover the key now, okay? We're going to use a, dis a distributed decryption protocol, okay? Um, remember that the encryptor uh, computed the uh, ciphertext uh, normally as, as before. We had shown this uh, earlier. So um, a ciphertext was RC where um, R was G to the power R and C was a message uh, times the public key to the power R, okay? And we also recall from above that uh, y is equal to g to the power of x. Yeah? So what we are going to do now is to exploit the group homomorphism that exists uh, here in this setup such that, a, uh, such that we can compute shares of this decryption key here. Yeah? Very colloquial, mathematically uh, speaking, high level. Uh, such that each participant, PI, basically contributes only a decryption share that it computes itself as G to the power, which is it, XI, okay? Okay, so this is going to be our intuition for what comes. Eh? So, um, to decrypt then, Yeah, each party, well, there's a, as a group, a set S of our F plus one processes. Yeah, and each process PI in our set computes just what I, what I wrote uh, above there. Um, let me call it, uh, no, this is, this is wrong what I wrote, okay? But the idea is basically the same. Let me just write, it contributes a share, which is a bi uh, computed as by the party itself as r to the power of xi, yeah? Where xi is the share that this participant has of the public key. And this is called a decryption share. Okay. So PI computes this, okay? Then PI sends PI to all uh, other, well, actually including itself to all parties or processes. And then this means that each process on its own will receive S, uh, F plus one such uh, decryption shares. And they are all in this, uh, with indices in this set S. Yeah? Or we could also use this as a kind of a service where a third client asks the servers, the processes for decryption shares, and then only the client would do the corresponding decryption operation later. Yeah? Now with our uh, set of shares, the decryption shares, bi for indices in our set, yeah? we can compute here, um, basically uh, the interpolation in the exponent uh, 
we are going to compute this by taking the product here over these values di to the power of these corresponding Lagrange coefficients that we have specified before already. Yeah? So this product here is going to be equivalent to um, the, sorry for the background noise here, apparently the Swiss arm is doing something, where um, we realized that uh, R, if encrypted properly, was um, capital R, was G to the R. This raised um, to the power Xi, and again raised to the Lagrange coefficient. I'm not going to write the full Lagrange coefficient here anymore. Um, but taking now, and now we can we can uh, um, take this this uh, product here and represent it in the exponent as a linear combination here of the values, um, well, that's still the g to the r here, xi times the lambda i, yeah? And we have said before that this linear combination of the xi's uh, times the lambda i's is going to be the secret key or the private key of the public key scheme. So this is going to be g time to the power of r times x. Yeah. Of course, you don't know this. Yeah, we are just computing this thing here. Yeah, you don't know when you take this product and raise it to this exponent that you're actually going to do this uh, because you're not going to see inside what happens. But then, um, according to the Al Gamal uh, scheme before, the value here is going to be equal to y to the power of r yeah so the final step will be very simple namely to compute what you also do in the other alchemal uh, in the single party uh, alchemal decryption operation namely you take um, the c from the ciphertext here and you divide r to the power of x out and r to the power Sorry, I, I, made a, I made a mistake here because we have, this is not going to be y to the r. This is going to be r to the power x, yeah? Because g to the r is capital R, as we said here. And the decryption operation that we had earlier in El Gamal, okay, the decryption operation where do we have the decryption operation? Here, yes, we take C and divide R to the power X, and this is how we decrypt the Elgamal crypto system, Elgamal ciphertext. So we are going to take uh, C divided by uh, this product above here of the Di's to the power of the Lagrange coefficients, and this is going to be the same as C divided by R to the power X, which is going to give us back the message that we wanted to decrypt. Yeah. And so that's going to be uh, the operation that they jointly have to contribute to, and it does not matter which process actually contributes this uh, to this decryption operation, as long as there are f plus one that are actually uh, contributing okay and that's how you can share the power of a decryption operation in a distributed system among n processes such that the system becomes uh, fault tolerant this is also known as the threshold uh, as a threshold public key uh, crypto system that uses the Elgamal, uh, underlying Elgamal crypto system, yeah? Okay, maybe now again, a question. Okay, Pause. so there is a, one question. Um, so count F plus one determines some kind of consensus to decrypt the message? <laughs> okay, uh, L let me answer more generally to the question, what has, does this have to do with uh, consensus, yeah? Um, let me just write here first that we need that nf is 
strictly less than n over two because otherwise it's not going to be secure. Is there a consensus needed for doing this? Um, not really. This can be driven by a client that would send, let me take a different color here. Huh. The client could simply send a request to this set of F plus one processes and each process does this here and sends this DI back to all parties. It equivalently could it send it back to uh, a client that requested this decryption, right? Now, of course, in the system itself, you have to have some kind of notion of what we are going to decrypt, yeah? Um, maybe it is something where everybody can just ask for decryptions, yeah? If anybody can ask for decryptions, a faulty client could also do the same, and then this would not guard the secrecy of something that's encrypted with it, yeah? So at least it's required that the party here, before it sends this, does some kind of check if we implement this, in, if we integrate this in a system after checking that this uh, is authorized. Yeah? Then we don't really de operate the decryption services. Uh, a particular way to implement this check could be that somebody broadcasts something on a total order broadcast channel or on a consensus channel where we use the idea of state machine replication. And I'm pretty sure that um, that has been talked about, but the idea here is that all the processes, they work through a sequence of requests and they all work through the same sequence of requests. And if the request says, compute a decryption share for this Elgamal ciphertext, then they will all either de decrypt it because they recognize it is authorized or they will not decrypt it because they all, the honest ones, recognize it's not authorized. So in that sense, yeah. with consensus, you can implement this in a safe way. Otherwise, we need a local check that it is okay to decrypt, um, but it's not necessary to implement consensus for building, or it's not a prerequisite to have consensus for decrypting. Yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, can you maybe um, recall uh, the interpretation of F and how it is related to N? Yes, yes. I was writing this while you were speaking less. F is the fault tolerance of the scheme, right? And um, with this tolerates F faulty or corrupted um, processes, yeah? Now, what, they, what can they do? They can leak their secret shares to another cell, as, as if they would uh, disclose this to somebody else. It has to be the case that our F here is strictly less than N over 2, and uh, because otherwise it would not be possible to form such a set of correct uh, uh, processes, yeah? Um, this hints normally at a, if you have a threshold of n over 2, this would hint at a system that is synchronous uh, with crypto, for example. But here, actually, the scheme itself here is completely non-interactive in the sense that uh, the decryption operation is driven, uh, can be driven by a third party, a client. And there is no, there's not even interaction needed. As I wrote here, it could all send their decryption shares to the third party client again. So this scheme has also been called non-interactive for decryption. There are many more elaborate such distributed crypto systems where the parties go in one round after another round after another round and do some operation. They're always computing with shared values that are held in superposition. And for these protocols, it will matter whether we're looking at synchronous or asynchronous implementations here. This is purely non-interactive scheme. Yeah, and uh, question from me, actually, I, I lost focus for a while. So the, when you distribute the uh, uh, the, um, the shares, the shares uh, like the mm -hmm. GIs, uh, mm -hmm. do you assume also that these coefficients lambda are, are public knowledge? So to compute uh, the uh, GIs, yeah, I didn't 
explicitly focus on this, but the Lagrange coefficients are public information because the Lagrange coefficient definitions I follow from the indices of the parties in the set here, yeah? Um, uh, so we can, we can write this up here and say, uh, note that the lambda um, S0i's are public, uh, publicly known. There's nothing secret there. Um, actually, you can compute them on the fly because when you are going to do the decryption operation and suppose now the step here of, of uh, recovering get another color let me take uh, red again the red step here that this step is done only say by the client huh? by one single client yeah? the client can dynamically receive such the decryption shares and once it has a set of enough of them, namely the set S here of F plus one, it looks at the indices of those processes from which it has actually received uh, decryption shares. And then you can just compute the Lagrange coefficients on the fly. But you need to know the whole set before you're starting to do the co uh, cooperation here because the set enters the cal calculation again. I, I skipped over this, but you can look it up in any textbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, a uh, classical question, why f should be less than n over 2? Why should this uh, be n over 2? Ah, um, because we said, actually it follows from the definition, right? We said for the secret sharing, any f um, or uh, fewer processes cannot get information on s, but any f plus 1 must get back the whole information, right? So um, if you had um, an F that is more than one half, right? Um, there wouldn't be any enough processes left to recover the secret later on that are correct, yeah. Well, the, the, the ones here are the faulty processes. You have to divide the processes in faulty ones and in correct ones, right? And F can be faulty. And there have to be enough correct ones that can recover the secret for you later. And, and faulty, you mean uh, non-responsive? Ah, now faulty is a good question. Let me just uh, let me just write this up. Um, I just wrote corrupted here. Okay. Yeah. Um, they cannot be arbitrarily deviating from the protocol because you will realize if they send us back some DI here that is garbage, then we are not going to decrypt to the correct thing, right? Um, so the corrupted processes. They may leak their shares, but not do anything worse. Yeah, um, they also may be non-responsive, right? And this is also it's a failure model where we can combine being non-responsive and uh, leaking in secrets, yeah, but not anything worse. Yeah, so corrupted means non-responsive uh, faults or leak leaking any secret that they have yeah? you can compare this to a read-only attack on a server where you can break into the server and see what's there but you cannot cause the server to deviate from the protocol there are uh, extensions of these protocols a lot of them that make it so-called robust also such that the parties may be may behave byzantine in byzantine ways and do arbitrary and bad stuff send us back bad values what we would do then is add together uh, the party would then in order to prevent this would have to add a zero knowledge proof for the fact that it computed the di properly that is actually done in some implemented systems already as well with zero knowledge proof we don't have time to talk about those here yeah okay uh, there's one more question yeah. um, um... Okay, by assuming S as a trusted process, we are abstracting out the math model from such problems as for process S being a single point of failure. Okay, so we, we don't assume that uh, the trusted process uh, is, uh, is, can be faulty. 
Yes, so the dealer, the trusted process uh, here in our abstraction must be correct. Yeah, and so we've, we've, make, we've introduced in that sense a single point of failure, right? So I, uh, I call it trusted process, yeah? Uh, the trusted is correct by assumption. And you're right by saying now we have a single point of failure. However, um, there exist protocols such that we can generate such a secret from scratch by just sending information forth and back among uh, uh, the protocol participants. The process is uh, P1 up to Pn. Yeah. So let me just write this up here as well. There exist protocols for generating uh, for generating a distributed um, public key in the sense above um, using ordinary techniques, uh, multiple rounds, for example, And always they also need consensus. They need an atomic broadcast primitive underneath. Yeah. So that exists. Yeah, some pointers are given in the handout on distributed crypto as well. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can show one of some of those protocols just to, for us to give a pointer. They're known as DKG protocols, yeah. <laughs> Um, in the handout here, uh, let me look at that over here. I, can, I think I, I've, I've noted there's a paper by, oh, it's maybe not noted in here, but uh, the protocol, so there's a protocol by uh, Gennaro Halevi, uh, is the reference in the uh, Gennaro Halevi Kravchuk, and I'm reading it here. Oh, this is the wrong one. Okay the wrong by Gennaro. Anyway, let me give you a different reference. Um, uh, see the, the protect um, toolkit for robust threshold cryptography. You can search on this. Uh, you can search for this on Google and you'll find a GitHub repository that actually contains the code that implements this in a um, asynchronous distributed system where the consensus layer is implemented by the BFD smart uh, platform for robust uh, threshold uh, cryptography. Okay, so it's, it also tolerates Byzantine failures. That will tolerate a number of Byzantine failures because it contains the zero knowledge proofs, it contains Byzantine uh, um, actions by the participants, but for the consensus layer, we're going to need F less than uh, N over three. Okay, and okay. So the, the uh, systems which uh, use zero knowledge to, to, or, uh, for facing uh, Byzantine uh, adversaries, uh, do I understand it correct that they are also known as verifiable secret sharing? Uh, that's another topic. <laughs> verifiable okay. secret sharing is yet another topic. I actually want to talk about something else, but let me just mention what verifiable secret sharing means uh, verifiable secret sharing is a protocol uh, among our N participants or N uh, processes where one of them acts as the dealer in a secret sharing scheme, right? A protocol among N processes such that one uh, process PD is like this trusted entity that wants to share its own secret among the others. Yeah, it acts as a dealer. I'm not sure if I call it dealer above, but in the handout it's called dealer. And the other participants, they reach a kind of agreement on the fact whether or not this PD has correctly terminated the sharing. So you can compare this to a uh, situation of like a reliable broadcast protocol where 
Um, if one participant determines that this dealer has correctly shared a secret or its secret, then every other correct participant will eventually also determine that it has correctly shared, uh, uh, this PD has correctly uh, done the sharing, right? And it may or may not be, if this is a faulty guy, a faulty PD, it may or may not be the thing that it started with, but it's guaranteed that later on from this verifiable secret sharing, if any F plus one come together again, they're going always going to reconstruct the same thing. Because otherwise you can think that the dealer that is faulty is going to cook up shares such that one recovers this and one recovers another one. Okay, okay. so this is exactly facing the problem of trusted dealers. So this is a trusted trust dealer problem, but notice that this is PD is one of our participants, so it would have to be excluded later on. Yeah, uh, But this is a primitive that is typically used in the following way, where in a protocol, every participant acts as a dealer. And once we have a set of um, processes that has correctly done the sharing, we add all the corresponding uh, secrets implicitly together and we get a public key that nobody actually knows because uh, we're going to have F plus one such dealers who correctly produce the sharing. And so there's no set of F who actually knows what's in there. And by adding up all these shares together and correspondingly multiplying their public keys, we are going to get out the, um, uh, the public key that was generated like this in a distributed way. There's actually a blueprint of these DKG protocols that I mentioned above here. Okay, okay thanks. Let me let me talk about one more thing, namely about a distributed pseudorandom function, yeah? Uh, we had already yesterday talked about PRFs, yeah? Uh, pseudorandom functions. Um, just to recall, the pseudorandom function, that was a function that had two... Um, uh, arguments, namely a key. Uh, I think this was lambda bits, and for the sake of simplicity today, we're using an arbitrarily long uh, second argument where we can evaluate the function on, and it always outputs again, let's say, a k-bit string, yeah? So a pseudorandom function uh, just produces randomness, unpredictable randomness, if you don't know the secret key, yeah? Unpredictable or randomly looking values and a different randomly looking value for each uh, input. Yeah. So we have yesterday formalized this also like this, as if we are giving here a, um, um, let me look at the argument here, what's going to be our argument, a V, and then it's going to give us a value that um, is uh, indistinguishable from a truly random value. In the way that we formalized yesterday, from a random k-bit string, yeah? And now uh, we can use um, a combination of the tools we have seen before, plus another trick to implement such a pseudorandom function in a distributed system, just like we had seen the threshold crypto before, yeah? So we are going to lose a uh, PRF construction. Oh, let me first describe what the hash function is that we're going to model as a random oracle, yeah? So uh, let a function h uh, that maps, um, say, uh, we're going to use two functions here, a function h that maps our arbitrarily long bit strings into the group g, where we're going to assume that the Diffie-Hellman problem is hard, also the uh, computational Diffie-Hellman problem is hard. Um, in practice, we're going to implement this with a hash function in the 
uh, analysis of the scheme, we are using that this hash function is a random oracle. Yeah? That means the hash function itself behaves again a bit like a public um, um, random function as a random oracle. What this exactly means, I leave it to the for, to you to read, but it means that uh, implicitly, colloquially, that whenever we call this H with a different input, we get a truly random ele element of G back. Yeah? We need also a second hash function H prime that is going to map as um, not strings, but elements of G to uh, the set of K bit uh, strings, yeah? because our pseudonym function here will want to output K bit strings. Okay? So then we can define the pseudorandom function that we want. And we had a key here that was K. Well, let me replace this key by an X. Huh? Yesterday it was a K, today it's going to be an X. Um, our pseudorandom function of a value here, we are now simply going to take our input value, use the function h to map this into the group g, okay? And when we are in the group g, we raise it to the power x. Yeah? And x is our exponent, our secret key again, that is in zq, okay? So this is a secret key of the pseudorandom function, yeah. And now we have an, an element in G and we are going to map this again to uh, keys that are, uh, sorry, to output values that are k-bit strings with our second hash function, yeah. The second one does not have to be in the random oracle. Yeah? So this hash function now, uh, sorry, this pseudorandom function fx has a distributed implementation that is just like the Algamal threshold crypto system, the threshold of the mal crypto system we saw before, it's actually even simpler, right? But I started with the other one because of the conceptual uh, difference, yeah? So this, uh, this uh, implementation here is again, as before, we are sharing somebody has shared X among P1 up to Pn such that pi holds si, no, xi, where xi is the polynomial A inter, uh, evaluated at i, and A of x is again our, or well, capital X, yeah? <laughs> Let's make this a z. is again a polynomial of degree f such that we can have uh, aj times z to the power of j here, a random polynomial with a0 equal x. Yeah? So the secret itself, the secret key is again put into the constant term of the polynomial. And now um, the protocol is the same as before. Yeah. To compute uh, this f of x evaluated on v, on a value that you can just send to anybody, right? Uh, every party that wants to cooperate, every correct party, pi computes a share of this key, right? a share of this uh, pseudo random value. And now that is going to be uh, maybe just like before. A di, sorry, let me just close the window. It's too noisy here. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> di, as before, by not taking the decryption exponent, but now computing h on v, raising this to its own exponent. This was xi. Okay and send di to the client that wants to 
in evaluate this pseudorandom function. Eh? Or can also send it to every other participant in the in, in, in the system as well. Yeah. And then to compute uh, the function itself, namely f of x on v, um, we do take again the product. Well, we, we're going to do this from from di with from a set of such di's with i in this index set um, of at least f plus one uh, processes. We're going to take this uh, product again over the set of these values di raised to the Lagrange coefficients, so the, the whole rest is like is the same as before, right? Um, we can call this here, uh, let me call this um, A, okay? And once we have done that, we can compute uh, the second hash function on this. The second hash function was the H prime hash function of A. And this is going to give us f of x evaluated at point at v and this is a pseudo random value that had that uh, in particular was unpredictable before the moment at which uh, these uh, processes here released their shares as we can say that, that say they sent their shares to this client or to another one yeah uh, yes so that uh, F plus one uh, correct uh, processes are needed. It's a feature now huh? in certain situations to uh, recover this value of the pseudorandom function at a value V. Are needed, well, it not necessarily always takes f plus one, correct, because the faulty ones could also contribute to this, but um, um, with f plus one, it's sufficient to recover this. At least one is actually needed, yeah. Well, let me let me fix this, okay. Um, and at least one is needed. This is a element that one can actually use in certain protocols and this goes back to a randomized Byzantine in agreement protocol as also noted in the handout here uh, where we can rely on the fact that this value f of x at point v remains unknown to an adversary in a randomized consensus protocol up to the moment where at least one honest process has determined that is now time to release this share and to go on in the protocol itself, yeah? Okay, um, that is pretty much how far we can get here at the moment, because if we wanted to talk also about distributed signatures, we would take a lot more time than what we have left. Um, also, the implementations for RSA, for example, are not so mathematically nice because we could not do the interpolation in the exponent. We'd have to do a restricted uh, scheme here. You can read some of that in the handout here. Okay. At this time, I think maybe it's another round of questions that we could go into. Or we defer until the discussion later. Let's, let's wait a few seconds.
One thing, and maybe you can receive the question in the background and just interrupt me when. One question that comes up in this situation is uh, in this kind of distributed crypto uh, implementations or systems that use it is going to be, oh, well, now we have our set of uh, participants. Yeah, and let me draw a, a diagram like we usually do in this case. So we're going to have N participants. Yeah. And they all run P1, P2, Pn. And at some time, they can be broken into, right? And we can tolerate here, uh, as we said, maybe um, F less than N over 2 corruptions. Maybe sometimes even also only F less than N over 3 such faults. Yeah? But if a process here is faulty and becomes broken into it has lost its share it's exposed its secret right because here there was an xi that is leaked now here was an x1 that is leaked yeah and if i get enough if i get f plus one of such x's shares from a particular time then i can recover the secret yeah so is it realistic to assume that uh these processes are never not, uh, broken into all of them together um, and to counter this uh, danger, uh, because if you would now assume that we, we recover or resurrect, uh, let's say resurrect this process again after a while, right? We could also resurrect this one again after a while. Uh, the, the share itself has leaked. Yeah, you cannot undo this. We can resurrect a protocol uh, participant. We can resurrect a, a, a process by starting it again fresh from a, a, a trusted ROM, a read-only memory, for example. And how can we tolerate that uh, in our system that such shares are leaking over time? How can we make this system long-lived? The idea here is something I'm going to do sketch only. It's called proactive uh, resharing. We're going to introduce sort of time. Uh, it's going to take a moment of time, but we're going to introduce phases, yeah? Uh, uh, first phase, the second phase, or epoch, we can also call it. But after each epoch, there is a protocol. Yeah? And the protocol that we are running here would be called a proactive uh, resharing uh, protocol. And the proactive resharing protocol has the feature that it takes a set of shared values, uh, sorry, a, a value that is shared among the system like this, and that it produces, a different color here, it produces a fresh sharing, the blue one, x2, xn from the x1, from the red ones, such that the phase two, the blue uh, uh, sharing is, independent of the previous sharing up to the fact that they share the same master secret yeah and at the third at the other epoch here we can do the same right we can go on and produce yet another sharing and generally speaking this protocol that runs here when we go from one phase to the next that's an interactive resharing protocol it's going to require several rounds but has been implemented in prototypes, probably not ex probably not re really running in practice, but it's been implemented and prototyped, such that you take um, these shares itself, themselves, you're going to dispute the shares again among others, and then correctly adding other shares together, such that from the old sharing, you're producing a fresh sharing, and it has the feature that the blue shares are independent of red shares. So the loss of some shares in the red phase does not harm, we can lose another F shares in the blue phase. And after we have progressed to the green time frame, we can again tolerate F of the green shares being exposed to an adversary. And with this, by introducing such a notion of time, and as we call it, proactively resharing this, because once we've broken, uh, we cannot recover the secrecy. But once uh, when we proactively reshare this every 24 hours, then we can tolerate F corruptions within each time window of 24 hours. And this is much more robust in that sense compared to um, just assuming that over the long, long lifetime of the system, there are not more than 
have such break-ins. Yes, that's an additional step. <laughs> and these protocols of uh, proactive free sharing are also uh, asynchronous as well as um, sharing itself. They are, uh, first, they were formulated in synchronous systems, but there have been uh, papers that extended those to asynchronous systems using a consensus primitive underneath. Uh, speaking of it, actually, I, I might have I might have developed one of those as well, the first asynchronous ones. Yeah, this is again stuff that was done in proto in, in, in theoretical research. Uh, it was done about twenty years ago. In implementations, as I said, it's not really become uh, live in the meantime. Mainly, I would say because the necessary consensus layers were not widely widely in use. Nowadays, with blockchain systems actually being used, this is much more prevalent, much more likely to be actually deployed, yeah. And some threshold crypto systems have been deployed um, in, in certain situations. Um, but don't ask me whether there is actually a implementation of this asynchronous resharing. Um, what we have done here in our lab, and this is now top-notch research, there was this protect platform I mentioned earlier that uses the BFD smart library for consensus underneath. And what we have done is replaced this BFT smart library with the consensus layer in the, of the Tendermint uh, blockchain platform, which is just the same uh, primitive, namely consensus and total order broadcast, and uh, run this on top of this other primitive. Uh, there is some technical report forthcoming about this, but um, that's uh, work that is being still is still being done in the laboratory nowadays. Um, there have been some blockchain companies that were uh, using certain threshold crypto systems, but um, I have yet to see one that has operated in this proactive resharing way here for, for years. Yeah, the idea, of course, would be to run this system here for many, many years, but that has not yet happened, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, in the origin, this problem of proactive resharing was stated for the model with, uh, how you say it, uh, non-responsive or leaking processes. Uh, in the original uh, model, you mean? Yeah, well, the, the, the assumption about uh, the ability of changing the oh, shares. Oh, without... you can, it's, it's like a multi-dimensional uh, security world again, where initially the system was synchronous and used uh, less than uh, less than half of the participants to be corrupted passively so that they could just leak yeah or maybe crashing but this may not even have been considered right and then uh, you can in each of the dimensions you can add a step or add uh, more uh, um, realistic assumptions and then remove some kind of a um, single point of failure so you can relax this to asynchronous you can relax it to uh, they behave uh, arbitrarily then we need to add zero knowledge proofs to this um, the construction of these tools is relatively modular this is very well known how to do that but still it is very well known in theory it's not in practice <laughs> Basically speaking when you say asynchronous you cannot say that you use consensus then <laughs> Well, well, no, uh, we could use the randomized consensus and use consensus with uh, all but ex um, all but uh, a negligible probability. Okay. Well, I think we should uh, wrap up for the lecture. Okay. So we resume half an hour with the discussion. And uh, thank you very much. And, uh, we'll, 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 we'll just stop now and... Uh, and continue. Okay. I'll just leave this on here and turn off the video and we'll resume here in half an hour, okay? Uh, no, okay. it's not here. I, it's going to be. Oh, it's a different link, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll send you a link. And uh, maybe it has uh, already arrived in the background. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. All right. See you there. Okay. Later. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Yes.